Garu, can he send you? Can she send you her slides? Yes, I will ask her. Okay. If she yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I told Steph to to do that, but I will okay. call her. Okay. Thanks. Because she's not online here, so I can't write to her. I don't have her phone number or private. I, I will call her and let her know that she has to actually send the slides. Mm -hmm. So can I go on? Yes. Okay. How do you see my slides? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, I was in the other meeting and I was there as early as um, 1.25. So I want to talk briefly on complexity of biological macromolecules. And um, I'll be using lipid, lipid transfer and on constant risk constants as the title I will just look at. So I'm Jonathan Babalala from University of Ibadan in Nigeria. I'm basically a physical chemist. Okay. Um, so I'm basically a physical chemist. I work on biophysics, I work on biophysical chemistry. So I move around within that range. So this is a typical lipid bilayer which is very important for all membranes. And you can see the structure you have here is really complex. You have um, oligosaccharides, you have um, alpha helix proteins, you have lipids in between, you have globular protein, you have phospholipid. So you have this complex. And this must be this way for the membrane to function well. And then, um, the, major, the three major type of lipid you actually have will be the phospholipid, the ferrous type, the glycolipid, and then cholesterol. So I decided to pick on cholesterol because of um, the kind of idea we have about cholesterol. The problem with cholesterol is that it is synthesized, it can be transferred, but it is not degraded. For most other lipids, when they are synthesized, they can be broken down, they can be transported. So it's easier to regulate where and where they go, how and how they move, and how the bow accumulate within the system. The major problem is that the moment you cannot make a balance of the synthesis, the transfer, and the degradation, it becomes a disease. So in this case, to say cholesterol cannot be degraded, then it makes it a special lipid that has to be watched. So, um, what we actually do, since it cannot be broken down, what we think we should do is actually to find a way of how to transport it from places where we discover that it's already accumulating. Some people have tried to do this before, but the kind of experiment they perform um, looks somehow. It's like um, you want to monitor cholesterol, the molecular mass is known, and you bring a, flu a, flu a fluorescence, if a fluorescence um, label, and you attach it to it. The fluorescence label itself is much heavier than cholesterol. So when you are looking at the movement of cholesterol, invariably what you are seeing will not be the exact, um, exact um, movement that you have within the um, membrane. So what we decide to do in this case, so avoid that error, is to actually get our cholesterol and label it. So there's little difference between a cholesterol that has been labeled carbon-14 and carbon-12. So that gives us relatively what we actually need. And the transfer, the accumulate, when you have cholesterol accumulation, you have three types of diseases that can, actually, that can actually occur. You can have the Neumann peak type C disease, you have type 1 and type 2. You can have the hypercholesterolemia, and then you can have the Waldman syndrome. Um, the Nipman, the, uh, Nipman pick, the type C is what we actually want to use. There's a protein called MPC2. That is one of the lipids that are associated with this disease. So this, okay, so I just give this uh, abbreviations that will publish the scene here during the presentation. So when you look at a typical endocytosis in the lysosomal membrane digestion, you discover that cholesterol is more at the membrane ends and it reduces as you go into the inner cell. Whereas BMP, one of the phospholipids, you don't have much in, and then it, um, 
increases as you go inside. And then ceramide is more, it's low at the top, and then at the center you have more, then you have lower at the other end. So what we have done here is to actually prepare our liposomes. Liposomes will replicate what you actually have within the body system. So we made, um, we make sure that we have composition that looks like what you actually have within the body system. Of course, we cannot replicate it exactly, just to give us an idea of what to do. So we did two things. One, our cholesterol label here. This is our cholesterol 14. We added BMP. We added PC. PC is just to make up for it. Then we had Bautin PE. This Bautin PE is to help us to be able to remove our uh, magnetic bits that we are going to add later to separate our cholesterol from the rest of the lipid. So we have a donor that is scanning cholesterol. And then we have an acceptor here that has just BMP, PC, and has um, MBDP. MBDP is, is a fluorescence label, not on our lipid, but we want to use it to monitor whether we still have our membranes intact. So if it is labeled and we're able to separate it, then we know that whatsoever we have is intact. So this is the process that we use for the experiment. I want to go into details of this. So um, we had so many controls. You know, in biological systems, when you are doing experiments, you want to be sure that um, one thing has not contaminated the other. So we have a donor alone that we can check at the end. We have the acceptor, we have the donor and acceptor together. We have the donor and we have our biomark. That's to separate about things from it. And then we have the acceptor and the um, biomark. Then we have so we have all this kind. And the cytoscope, the eight here, is actually to help us to be sure that what we have is within country because this will be a protein that is not known to transport cholesterol. So I will just go on. So this is the kind of experiment that we have in mind that if you have this here, the, your MPC2, as you move between one membrane to the, the other, you have a donor here that this will be picking from, you'll be picking from here, and of course it will be just going around, and then you transfer cholesterol from one to the other. Um, this is just a typical thing. You have a goal here, you have a donor, and here you have an acceptor, so what do you want to do? Well, want to, the, this is the goal, you want the two to be this way, and then the next thing is you have two options. The first option is that you get into the water here, you swim here and get to this place. Or the other option is that you take a parachute and then get to the other, up, to the other side. So MPC2 here is like, it's like a parachute. The reality is that when you add donor and acceptor without any protein, they will still be transferred. So that would be like swimming, but it's not going to be as much as when you have um, MPC2 to help with the transfer. So this really looks like um, what the membrane, the lab looks like. So you have a donor that has 100% radioactivity, no fluorescence at all. It doesn't have NBDP. And this is a sector that has no radioactivity at all, but it has fluorescence. So when you mix these two together, and later you add your um, biomax cavidine, and then you separate. You have this in the supernatant, and then you have this so you can separate the two from one another. And then now, you see, you have fluorescence in one, and then you have your um, the cholesterol will have probably gone to the other side. So the kind of results we got from this kind of transfer, you know, it's so complex. Now, the problem is you are transferring cholesterol. You are using MPC2. What we discovered later from various experiments we did is that even some of the other lipids are also being transferred. It's just that we monitor only cholesterol. So we cannot say from the complexity that the complex situation we have, you cannot really say that that has only transferred cholesterol alone. But looking at the amount of cholesterol we have transferred, you discover that um, at the various temperatures, you have this transfer. You know, at zero degree, 25 degree, 37 degree. So that means the higher the temperature, the better the transfer that we have. And if you look at this, this is without MPC2. The maximum you have, which is the spontaneous transfer, is around 40. 
Now with MPC2, you can see what we have is close to 10 times, it's close to 10 times. So um, that gives us the impression that using MPC2, you can always have a better transfer of cholesterol. Um, if you do it with a function of pH, we have some, we have a provider that looks this way, but of course with pH, we have to change the various type of buffers. That's why you can have a smooth curve because of the, um, the buffer various buffer capacities. Um, this is when you do it with concentration, concentration of MBC, MPC2. And I need to say that the MPC2 we used here, we extracted it from bovine milk, that's cow milk. Um, it took close to six months to do that. And then, um, okay, this is also time dependent and temperature dependence. If you look at them, and when we added, um, we changed ionic strength, you also have a quite a number of things. So you can see all these things affect whatsoever we have. Uh, because of time, I think I will skip some of this. Um, so here we change the ratio of the donor to acceptor. The one that we found that will probably be best would be to use a ratio of one um, donor to five acceptors. And then, so we have to vary before, not to vary um, the ratio of donor to acceptor and see where we have the best option. And then this is what actually happens in the, in the body, the physiology. Um, so this is what we have. Yeah, when we ferry the ratio of donor to acceptor. And then um, here we look at various donor liposome when we ferry the concentration as well. And now, just like I said, that if you look at this graph here, you'd see that we, there are so many other proteins that can actually transfer cholesterol. And all of them are, pro, are you know, present within the body system. So that makes it very, very complex because you are not talking of one factor, now not two factors, not three factors, about four or five factors working together. So, but you can see here that the gly glycosylated um, MPC2 actually has the highest um, level of transfer. Um, now we had a problem. The problem we had was that after the experiment, we discovered that our fluorescence also appeared in the sample that we withdrew from the transfer that we got. So that means that some of the donor actually has um, fused with the acceptor. So if you look at this, so instead of just getting and going, it has formed another um, liposome. Now this has become a big problem. And then, so that is whatever we think we have here. It's not purely the donor, any, uh, the acceptor any longer, but a mixture of donor and acceptor. So we have to use fluorescence to begin to measure and see what quantity of our acceptor has actually gotten into the donor and then vis a -vis. So we look at what to do. So initially we are thinking of how to do this theoretically, but we discover it's very difficult. So eventually what we did was to find a lipid spanning membrane to resolve that issue. So I will just jump all this and then go to the next one, which looks very simple, but very interesting to us. We have, um, we have five minutes left, please. Okay, yeah, I'll be very fast. This is a simple structure of hemoglobin. It has four um, polypeptide chains. And the expectation is that when you have a molecule reacting, um, you swear this is a typical equation for it and this the formula for calculating the equation. Normally, we react this with DTMB because we use sulfhydride. Um, we use um, sulfhydride agents to react with the sulfhydride group that we have in hemoglobin. And essentially, we look at beta 93 system, beta 93. Um, so we have all these complex profiles. So let me just go to this. Now, the same hemoglobin. You react at the same, you react with um, the same quantity of reagent DTMD. And then when you react at five micromolar, you have when you react with 10 micromolar of hemoglobin, you have this profile. When you react with 15 micromolar of hemoglobin, you have this profile. The expectation is that normally when you fail concentration, your rate constant ought to be constant. So we discovered that our rate constant is not constant. Now you have a problem, we just think, what do we use 
what do we use this problem to solve? So what we eventually did was actually now to take varying concentration of hemoglobin. And we calculated the apparent rate, second order apparent rate constant for each of them. And we have profiles that look like this. Now, our final um, conclusion is that when you have hemoglobin in lower concentration, the, you have it more in diamond form. So that means the hemoglobin we have we are, we are all are actually not in the tetramer form. So you have tetramer now going to diamond. So what we did was just use a simple kinetic thing that you have, okay, when you have all tetramer, you have one, and then the amount that are associated is alpha. And of course, a simple dissociation for that will be the equilibrium constant, that, the K that we have minus KT, and this. And of course, our K42, which is now our dissociation constant, is going to be this equation. So this we did, and what we have, we have the K apparent, we have the alpha, and we have the failure PK42, uh, PK which this actually should be constant, but of course we have a cutout where we cut off and then we don't take the rest value. So as you can see from here, the total concentration we've taken is just at 10. This is in tetrama, so this is just at um, 10 micro in. So these values that you have here has given us a value that we eventually now plotted our PK42 against pH. And this has given us um, an important biochemical value, which we call the bore, um, at the, bore as the acid bore effect. And um, from here, we could calculate our bore effect, which ordinarily we have to do all that kind of experiment that we may not be able to perform in our environment to determine. Um, so we, we did that for oxyhemoglobin, we did that for carbon monoxide hemoglobin, and we did that also for met hemoglobin. So now we had a problem, and that problem we have turned into another instrument to be able to come up with um, biochemical values, in this case, the acid boy, the acid boy effect and the alkaline boy effect of our hemoglobin, and the transitions for oxy hemoglobin and then carbon monoxide hemoglobin are given here. So I think I will just stay here and thank everybody for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, your talk was uh, really nice. And actually it's open to questions. Ali, I guess you. <laughs> I, I wait for uh, uh, some students to ask and then I'll ask. <laughs> okay. I don't see any hand raised. No question in the forum. Does anyone has written in the forum and that I cannot see? I can't see anything. So Ali. I, uh, Jonathan, thanks for your talk. Uh, Thank you. So it, it, of course it, it was, you know, as you know, our audience here is very diverse. Yeah. Okay, so um, so just to, to try to make some connections with uh, with other people in the audience uh, from yeah. different fields, um, you mentioned very uh, flirtingly that you would try to do uh, some theoretical modeling or something. C can you describe, for example, what what type of problem in, in, that you're interested in experimentally uh, would would need? Uh, or would benefit from some some modeling, or what what types of questions are you interested in asking or helping getting interpretations on? Yeah, let me go back to this. Okay. Um, we have our carbon fourteen cholesterol, little bit carbon fourteen cholesterol in the donor, and we have our fluorescent label. MB, MPCBE in the acceptor. The, what we expect is that by the time we have the two and, and MPC2 has carried all the cholesterol from the donor to the acceptor, whatever quantity it will take, that at the end, we should have whatever we separate without fluorescence. No, that means we are not using any fluorescence from our acceptor. That means our, uh, our acceptor should maintain its 100% fluorescence. But for all the experiments, we discover at the end that they lost fluorescence. Now what happened? We discovered that what happened was that the acceptor 
some of them match with the um, donor mm. and form something that looks like this. So there was a fusion. I see. I see. We should be able to separate what quantity has fused, what quantity is in the acceptor, and what quantity is in the donor. I understand. Okay. Then, you know, we got so many values. We now felt, okay, is it possible for us to be able to simulate theoretically and say this should be the value that you have at a particular pH, at a particular connection, since we cannot differentiate between the fused one from the ones that are not fused. You know, I okay. so, small. so when you even check from electron microscope, you wouldn't be able to see so much of the difference. Uh, are you... Have you um, have you thought about using uh, techniques like uh, FRET, so fluorescence resonance energy transfer? Yeah, we, we we did, we did. It wasn't making so much so much difference. Actually, we wanted to use FRET to monitor the transfer, uh -huh. but the energy level generated by this was not strong enough. I see. Okay. So that was the basic thing we wanted to use initially. Okay. okay. Uh, Ali, there are two other people. Yeah, so perfect, perfect, perfect. Anna and Estelle, very quickly. Uh, well, for me, it was like, thank you first uh, about the talk. So I was just wanted to know if you try as a technique, which Ali had already asked. But uh, my question second about, is they have different shapes. So maybe if you try to see with the technique for, for example, to see the structure, like maybe FM or other technique, which is allowed to do the biological sample uh, under, I mean, in liquid, so you are in a safe place. Did you try to do that, or you are not interested to know uh, which, uh, what are you, what are you having as a structure? Well, no, the, the what what we did was to prepare our liposomes ourselves, and the liposome we prepared are just same. Um, 100, the size is 100. You know, after whatever we pass through the press so that we have liposomes. Now, yeah. the same type of liposome we have for acceptor is the same type we have for donor. Okay. So, AFM is not likely to make a difference between the two. So, okay. it's but, a of but how, how are you sure that it's, it, this is what you are getting? It's not about fluorescence. Okay, the fluorescence or the um, I mean, theoretical technique and tell you what is going on and so on. But what I am interested to know is there is a possibility to know that what you are having, it is real, it's correct as you are having here as a model. No, can I get the question again, please? I mean, how you characterize whatever you are uh, showing here? Um, well, actually what, what we have done, you use, um, we method the, the activity from the activity, we are able to know what amount of cholesterol has been transferred. We measure the fluorescence to know what um, we are, we are, and where our acceptors are. So our assumption initially is that all the acceptors we have full fluorescence, which we discover was not. And then our donor that will lose some um, radioactivity to the acceptor, that will tell us the amount that we have. All this we were able to precisely do. But the problem, um, the problem we had was that we discovered that we King Internet is back again. Oof, Mama Mia. <laughs> Unfortunately, maybe we won't have the time to ask your question. Uh, lost fluorescence. There we go. And therefore, that means that they are fusion. So, I think we lost him completely. Yeah, yeah. I was even surprised that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, okay, go ahead. So um, it will have been difficult to say this is what we have and this is what we have because they are the same size. Okay, Prof, I have to take another question from Estelle. Yeah. 
uh, I just have a very nice talk, by the way. But I have a very naive question from somebody who is not in the field. And so what will be the impact of your research, let's say, in real world? Can, can it help somebody to reduce maybe cholesterol in, in his body or something? Yeah, um, it's, it's not... Well, actually, people believe that the fatter you have, the more cholesterol you have. That is really not true. And the location of the quantity of cholesterol you have where it, you, the location where you have it is really much important. You know, I said initially that um, when you have it more in a place you ought not to have it, then you have disease. And there are three types of diseases I talked about. The Neiman Peak type C disease that I talked about is a rare um, degenerative disease. Um, you probably have about one in about one million having that kind of disease, and it's hereditary. So the experiment is actually to investigate that disease and be able to follow the pattern of the movement. If we have to follow, follow the pattern of the movement, this avis the other lipids that are present within the membrane. Then we can do a lot of other things, see what kind of energy level we need to be able to, to locate them appropriately. Easy, thanks. Thank you. So, any other question in the audience? I have a question still. Yes. Uh, Jonathan, you had a you had a slide. You you don't need to put it up now, where you showed uh, as a function of pH there was some yeah. um, strong sensitivity to something. I don't know what that something is. That's that's with hemoglobin. Uh huh. With hemoglobin. But um, what yeah. happened was well, after we discovered that our the the rate constant was not constant for hemoglobin reaction. And the cause we simply discovered was because the tetramer was dissociating to dimers. Mm -hmm. Dimers are faster, the tetramers are slower. So to know the ratio of tetramer dimer that has dissociated, we did the calculation we had there. So what we now have is PK42. That means dissociation constant vis a vis the pH. And when so we uh -huh. So, but, but just so, what is the um, do you, what is the molecular uh, reason why pH affects things so much? Um, actually, you know, within the body system, the pH should be around seven point four thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And once you have anything lower, the hemoglobin molecule will dissociate more. In fact, if you use an alkaline pH, you split off the um, church amount completely, but right? you lose, you, you, you unwind. Okay, so it creates like it, unf it does, it unfolds. Unfold, it you unfold completely okay. if you use very alkaline um, pH. So this one is still within stages where they are not folded, they are just separated into timer and church amount. And that actually helps us to calculate the amount of hydrogen released and hydrogen uptake by hemoglobin, which is very essential for body functioning. I see. Okay, thanks. Okay, Professor, thank you for your very nice talk and nice explanations. Uh, it was a really a good honor to have you for this session. Thank you. Thank Professor, you. I'm uh, very grateful. Not easy to handle because of problems, internet, and then uh, speakers who confuse links. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had so many emails. So yeah. the moment that from ICTP, I thought it was, I registered, I entered, I tested my microphone by around 1.30 thereabout, and nobody told me that was not the place. When it was time for me to be called, I saw I wasn't called. <laughs> so I'm sorry for, uh, I want to apologize to all the people in the audience for the small delay that we had at the beginning. So it was due to not the fault of the technician, but all these reasons that I just mentioned. So thank you very much. Now we'll have a break for 25 minutes. And then I would really advise you or invite you thank to you. attend the only yeah, thank you. talk that we have in 25 minutes. That will be given by Amanda Veltman. Uh, you know what the name means. And then particularly to young students who are interested in cosmology. I think there are many in the room. So let's see in 25 minutes. So Yeah, I mean, I would, I would just say uh, stick around. <laughs> uh in the 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 meeting room and uh, this is a good opportunity to socialize maybe 
uh, go, you know, go get yourself a coffee and have a virtual coffee uh, as you chat with people. Um, I just want to <coughs> remind you um, tomorrow morning, <coughs> we have the poster session between 10 and 12. Um, so uh, there are 30 posters that are going to be presented by the uh, uh, participants who submitted posters. Uh, in the first hour, uh, everyone will have, every poster participant has two minutes to quickly present their poster. And then uh, in the next hour from 11 to 12, everyone will go into their own rooms uh, where they can present their poster over a longer period of time to, uh, to different people who come into the, into the Zoom room.